Hello, and welcome to the Guest Writer Series. My name is Alan Borst. I'm the administrator of the Guest Writer Series here at the University of Utah. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Jenny Erpenbeck, all the way from Berlin, Germany. Today's program will begin with an introduction by Corley Miller, after which Jenny will read a couple of different selections from her work and talk a bit about them with Lance Olson. We'll invite a few of our creative writing graduate students into the conversation before then turning our attention to questions submitted by those of you attending today. Please note that the Q&A button, not to be confused with the chat button, has been enabled at the bottom of your screen. So feel welcome to share any questions for Jenny throughout the program. Also know that this event is being recorded and will be made available on the University of Utah English Department YouTube channel. We encourage you to purchase Jenny's books at your local bookstore. A link to the King's English Bookstore here in Salt Lake City will be posted in the chat momentarily. The Guest Writer Series was made possible through the University of Utah's English Department and received funding from Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks, as well as Utah Humanities. Utah Humanities empowers groups and individuals to improve their communities through active engagement in the humanities. This series is also supported in part by Utah Arts and Museums with funding from the state of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. Now let me introduce Amy Seiler. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. And now I'd like to invite Corley Miller to turn on his camera and mic to introduce Jenny Erpenbeck. Good morning. Often when we say that a writer is important, we mean simply that their work is very good and that since it is difficult to do even somewhat good writing, it is also important to recognize work that is very good. Jenny Erpenbeck's writing is very, very good. She is the winner of awards too numerous to list, including the Hans Falada Prize, the Thomas Mann Prize, and the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize. But I think her work is also important in a deeper sense than we sometimes mean. Many of the students in the PhD program here were born in the United States after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a historical position that meant we were for a long time encouraged to believe that we did not have a historical position, or indeed it had nothing to do with history. With other Americans, we have found ourselves recently, and at the very least, perplexed by the realization that history will have something to do with us, whether we like it or not. Urban Beck's novels, in which a lakeside house survives most of a century, the same woman dies five times in five countries, or a retired professor helps and fails to help a group of refugees, are deeply concerned with the frontier between the personal and the historic. In 2012's The End of Days, she writes of a worried father considering, I quote, the greatest riddle in all the history of mankind, how processes, circumstances, or events of a general nature, such as war, famine, or even a civil servant's salary that fails to increase along with the galloping inflation, can infiltrate a private face. Here they turn a few hairs gray, there devour a pair of lovely cheeks until the skin is stretched taut across angular jawbones. The secession of Hungary, say, might result in a pair of lips bitten raw in the case of one particular woman, perhaps even his own wife. If a person were to study a sufficient number of faces, he would surely be able to observe wrinkles, twitching eyelids, lusterless teeth, and draw conclusions about the death of a Kaiser unjust reparations payments, or a stabilizing social democracy. Urban Beck's work extends that study in both directions, demonstrating that the universal, the historic, the general, is at once inscribed within and composed of the particular, the present, and the human. In so doing, it reminds us that both in our lives and our writing, we need not only tell the story of a single name or a single desire, we may always tell are always telling a whole world of other stories also. Like so many of our cherished freedoms, this one is also a responsibility, an ought as well as a can. I'm so pleased to introduce Jenny Erpenbeck, from whom we have much to learn. 
Thank you so much for, for this uh, uh, very honorable uh, introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I chose um, one passage from Go and Gone. And uh, hopefully I will manage here to read it. Um, can you see me? Are you still see me a bit at least? Okay. Um, so this is a this is a dialogue between uh, uh, the main character of Go and Gone, the, the the retired professor uh, Richard, and some of his friends, who uh, who get interested in the in the things that um, have to do with the refugees he made friends with, and so he's telling he's speaking with them about the the African refugees he met. So, um, I, I go just in the middle of things. Uh, so they they are only allowed to work in Italy. Detlef asks at last, exactly, where there's no work, exactly. And the money they get there, it's only for a few months until it's been definitively, definitively proven that Germany bears no formal responsibility for them. And then, then they get be sent back to Italy where there's no work, exactly. Sounds like we have it pretty good here, Sylvia says. Richard thinks of his father who was sent to Norway and Russia as a German soldier to produce mayhem. That left thinks of his mother who with the same care with which she'd once braided her hair as a young German girl had later tapped the mortar from pieces of stone as a rubble woman helping to rebuild the country. Sylvia thinks of her grandfather who sent his wife the blood-stained linens of Russian children for their own children. The stains will come out easily in cold water. The great achievement of their forebears was, if you will, if you will destruction, the creation of a blank slate that their children and grandchildren then had to write on. And the great achievement of their own generation, the reason they were doing so much better than say, these three African men Richard was just talking about. The ones sitting on this sofa are post-war children. And so they know that the progression from before to after is often based on quite different principles than punishment and reward. There's no clear link between cause and effect. There's an indirect relationship. Richard thinks he's, um, Richard thinks as he's thought many times before in recent years, the Americans had their plans for one half of Germany and the Russians their plans for the other. Neither the material prosperity on one side nor the planned economy on the other could be explained by any particular trait of the German citizens, citizens in question. They were just the raw material for these political experiments. So what was there to feel proud of? What should they have thought of as better, as opposed to something inferior and other? They'd worked all their lives, that's certainly true and they hadn't been forbidden to work. Then these Easterners were embraced as blood relatives by their brothers and sisters on the other side of the wall. This blood they were born with, a circumstance beyond their control. Richard's friend, Monica's daughter-in-law, breastfeeding her post-war baby, always marveled at the apparent miracle by which a glass of Coca-Cola could be transformed inside her body into milk. No one knew for sure whether it was blood, coke or milk flowing in her veins, nor could any of them answer the question who deserves credit for the fact that even the less affluent among their circle now have dishwashers in their kitchens, wine bottles on their shelves and double glazed windows. But if this prosperity couldn't be attributed to their own personal merit, then 
By the same token, the refugees weren't to blame for their reduced circumstances. Things might have turned out the other way around. For a moment, this thought opens its jaws wide, displaying its frightening teeth. So this was the go and gone passage I chose. I thought it um, might be interesting concerning the change of Coca-Cola into milk. Great, thank you ever so much for that reading, Jenny, and for joining us in Salt Lake this morning, our time. Uh, and thank you, Corley, for your introduction and Alan and Amy for your warm welcome. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the pandemic for allowing conversations like this to happen, uh, which otherwise couldn't for myriad all too pragmatic logistical reasons. Um, having a chance to speak with you, Jenny, is such a pleasure. Let's begin with something you said in your acceptance speech uh, for the Zolotorn Literature Prize, which appears in Not a Novel. Um, you say, every time I start a new work, I ask myself the same questions. Ask myself if I, I've ever really known how to write down a sentence, just one to start with. How to look at a story, how it's even possible to turn the innermost things outward and then after stripping off my skin to peer through it. Each time I found I don't know anymore. And I'm, I'm just interested in hearing you talk a little bit, if you would, about this idea of writing as a mode of unlearning and perhaps how you experienced that as you researched and wrote Go Went Gone. Now, yeah, first, um, the, 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 the basic thing in writing is that everything, every text that you are going to write is a new text and has never been there before. So there is no comparison that can be made. Uh, and I think this is the, the, the main uh, difficulty in it. <laughs> so you have no, you have no measure. You, if, if you are doing some sports, you know how, how, how fast you have to run to, to be the winner or something like that. In writing, it's it's different. You just have to think carefully to figure out what the core of something is, and and is it's a, a different kind of process. And I um, even and if you have got some prizes or if you have found some readers, uh, every every book is is a new challenge, and there's no help. <laughs> You're very <laughs> alone. And um, so the, at least this is my experience. And, um, and the second part of the question. Oh, it was about uh, how, how that applied to go and gone. Uh, so yes, go and gone was a different kind of a challenge because I, uh, I thought um, one of the privileges of my, uh, yeah, so to say profession is that I can choose my my the the subject to write about, and that I can take my time to to look carefully at things or questions uh, for which other people don't have the time to do so. So um, my idea was to just uh, yeah like go into the middle of of uh, yeah of things and and just start talking to the refugees and figure figuring out why they uh, and how they are staying here in our cities, what they are doing and what are the difficulties why they cannot get some job or you know make their own money and so on. And <clears throat> uh, the, the challenge with this book was that um, the research and the writing went parallel, which normally isn't the case. Normally I, I, um, I do some, I, I, Sometimes I, it took me years to, to think about something before I sat down and started writing. But with this book, it was like uh, understanding and trying to understand and doing research and talking to people and sharing their lives in a way like taking part in demonstrations and in meetings and uh, accompanying them to some, some offices and so on. And, and writing in the same in the same time, and and this was interesting and was a different process than normally. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, you know, and your work is, as Corley was pointing out, is known for its deep social awareness and engagement and contemplating your own past in East Germany where your country, you know, disappeared overnight and one morning you found yourself an existential refugee. You look out on the present political situation in Europe in a way that resonates deeply, I think, with a lot of us and with what the Canadian poet M. Norbese Philip calls the forensic landscape of the Americas, a landscape of massacre and environmental catastrophe. And in your 2018 Puderbau keynote, you ask, why do we still hear laments for the Germans who died attempting to flee over the wall, but almost none for the countless refugees who have drowned in the Mediterranean in recent years? Why is it that the opening of the border in 1989 was something wonderful, but today voices cry out for new and stronger borders? And you said elsewhere with respect to the refugee crisis that the main mistake is in thinking of they and we, the idea of borders and the thought of keeping someone out in order to be safe ourselves. And I wonder how things have changed in Germany and in the EU in general with regard to refugees since you wrote Go Wink Gone, especially in the sad light of what's happening now on the border between Belarus and Poland. Hmm. And has Germany in particular and the EU in general learned anything of real substance? And if not, I just wonder, you know, what's to be done both inside literature and outside of it? Yeah, um, as far as I can see and understand the situation, uh, which is, is absolutely desperate at, at the border of, of uh, Belarus and Poland. Uh, refugees are again and again used as instruments for politicians. It, uh, in a way, it was the same with the African refugees that I met because um, uh, it, it, the first the first one who had the idea to send African refugees to Europe in order to put pressure on Europe, European polit politicians was uh, Gaddafi. So, so he, he said when the Europeans bomb us, we will bomb them with blacks. So this was, was a similar kind of, of politics. Uh, as it is now, and and what what I, makes me really, um, yeah, desperate because I cannot see any solution is that there is no solidarity between the European countries, and and they are not on the same level of of uh, of um, of an idea of solidarity, solidarity at least when when you. Um, all the years uh, Greece and Italy have been left alone with the refugees that came from the from the Mediterranean, and now, in a way, also the also Poland is left alone, and they want to build the border. But <laughs> I must confess, I think they got so much money from the European Union, and they didn't even take one refugee. You know, they 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 refused mm -hmm. to take any of the refugees so so in a way they should open their borders now but of course they 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 didn't change their minds and um i think that the the central question for for the future will be how the uh how the uh, how the vorräte also how the <clears throat> the food and all the resources are um uh, if, um, yeah, this is dispensed. Yeah, also, distributed. Uh huh. Also, uh, who gets it? <laughs> who yeah. who gets it, and and who doesn't get it? Because I think, uh, for for a moment, it's fine to make a strong border to just to keep what you have, but on long term, it, it's no solution. And I think the the borders that are are being being built now will uh, survive as badly as the Berlin Wall survived. 
and no, and is there a, oh i was going to say is there, is there a place for literature in this conversation then it seems like what you're doing in go and gone is at least bringing these things to the surface right and getting us to think about them but you know is that the be, is that the best we can do Naya, I wouldn't say the best, but this is one thing uh, language can do uh, to tell stories and to connect people by telling stories or listening to the stories of people. Mm -hmm. um, and also the stories that may seem exotic or strange to the reader in the first uh, moment uh, will be uh, recognized in the second moment as stories that could have been told also by by ourselves in in different situations and and we all especially in europe we have this kind of uh, therefore i read this this passage we have this kind of memory to at least our parents or grandparents have been um yeah they they have been leading the war but they have also been suffering from 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 what followed after the war, the bombings and everything. Yeah. Mm. Well, this might be a good time uh, to read a little bit from not a novel. Would you do a little of that? Yeah. I chose a passage uh, about the two uh, the two looks I I used to um, I I used to have when I walk through. E East and West Berlin, as I will, the double look. <laughs> um, right. How gray it was in East Berlin, said the visitors from the West who dared to set food in the Eastern part of the city. Only now I can imagine what an adventure it must have been back then, stepping into that forbidden zone after paying the price of admission by exchanging 25 West German marks for East German currency. Later, when I was a teenager living close to the border crossing at Friedrichstraße, Westerners would sometimes give me the leftover 20 mark bills that they hadn't managed to spend in the East. Those Westerners sometimes looked a bit embarrassed that they were treating me like a beggar. They looked like they didn't understand at all how the East actually worked, and they looked happy that they could return to the place they understood. In reality, though, East Berlin probably wasn't so much grayer than the West after all. At least that's my impression now that I know the West. The only things missing in the East were the advertising posters and neon signs decorating the pockmarked walls or concealing the bombed out lots. True, there was a there was a plaster crumbling from the walls of the buildings in Prenzlauer Berg, and there were some balconies that could no longer be used because they had fallen into disrepair. True, the front doors of the apartment buildings weren't locked because private property wasn't important, so sometimes a drunk would piss in the entryway. Fair enough. But what I remember most of all, grey or not, was an almost small town sense of calm. As a child, it gave me a strong impression that I was at home in a world that was closed off and thus completely and utterly safe. Seen from the outside, our everyday life under socialism might have seemed exotic, but we weren't a wonder or a horror to ourselves. We were the everyday world. And in that everyday world, we were among ourselves. The only thing that connected us as children to the so-called big wild world, the big, big wide world outside, were the care packages from the West, but not everyone get, got those. And, and international solidarity, the worldwide struggle for the release of Luis Cavalan or Angela Davis, for example. And as children, we translated those grand efforts into very manageable forms like bake sales or recycling drives, donating all of the proceeds to the cause. My parents' <clears throat> furniture was in the Biedermeier style and our money was light, 
like play money. Political immaturity wasn't a burden as long as you were actually a child. As a child, you love what you know, not the things that adults enjoy or strangers, just the things that you know. You're happy to know anything at all. And this happiness takes root and transforms itself into the feeling of being at home. And so, yes, I loved that ugly, supposedly gray East Berlin, forgotten by the whole world, but familiar to me, which doesn't exist anymore, at least not in the part where I lived as a child. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, you know, in your Bomberg lecture, you mentioned in passing, and, and you referred to this a little earlier, um, this idea that every text is fundamentally an attempt at a text. And I wonder, would you maybe talk a little bit about the, your perspective on experimentation in writing? In a sense, one can say all writing is, is an experiment, but in another sense, of course, it isn't. And also maybe related to that, maybe not. Speaking of borders, it seems to me your sense of the border separating so-called fiction and so-called nonfiction is quite permeable. And perhaps you could talk a little bit about your sense of these almost but not quite categories of writing. Naya, um, yeah, first it's, I think you wouldn't, you wouldn't start to write a book if it uh, wasn't a very, very intimate and personal thing. So uh, the, the reason, the, the starting point, at least uh, with me, is always something that really touches me and, and, and um, cannot be answered in an easy way. So, so whenever I have got the feeling that um, I need more time to think about something or to do some research to understand things that I cannot understand, <laughs> then this is the, the, like the starting point for me for writing. And uh, of course it's, um, I think you, at least for me, it's the main work is to, um, to make the de decision about the, the frame of the story or the, the things to, you take in, into view. And, what things to leave out <laughs> so so this this is uh and and of course when i start to to write a book it's it's like i just try it out and sometimes i i've got a feeling there's something waiting for me but i cannot see it clearly and then i try to to write as long as i need to to get closer to this question and of course the the um things that that are in the in the center of, of the book sometimes don't need sentences but they need the silence between the passages or they like often you write to in order as so i write in order to to make a surface surface and to to let people feel that under the surface there, there is something which cannot be said but, but you have to figure out what to tell in order to tell the untold things. You know what I mean, <laughs> I hope. I do know yeah. what you mean. Yeah, yeah. and um, uh, yeah, and the question of, uh, I think the, the out of so-called out of fiction is very fashionable nowadays. And of course, every book is, is in a way, more or less, I would say, a kind of, of a, also of a auto, autobiographical um, thing, but, but not directly. And it's like, yeah, I think the, the um, what you, what you should try to, to, um, to do is uh, to look at yourself from a, from very far, from a great distance, 
and um, to, in a way, um, to speak about yourself as of a like historic person, as a, not in the big sense, but but in the in the very normal sense, like like a person that is involved in history. Uh, and sometimes I used to say my the family I have is an example for some human beings that is given to me as material to know better, to to do uh, thorough research on them because I I have been knowing I have been knowing them for a long time. I know all the connections between them. I know more or less the secrets. Meanwhile. <laughs> the untold things I, I know people that like each other other or doesn't like each other and don't like each other I, I know their stories of uh, uh, wandering around like in Europe during the war and, and and so on and so on so what I try to do is to to look at the concrete material that is given to me by chance by this or that family, by friends, by whatever, by myself, as an example. And I try to look at all this uh, in order to understand better what uh, makes the so-called big history come true in the lives of people. And how, how the big history is looking like. It's, it's not something that is written in the book. as. The, the passage uh, that, that, that was read by your colleague before, history is something that you can only see in the lives of people. Thank you. Well, this might be a good time to open up our discussion to several of our graduate students. So uh, Amy, Daniel, Alyssa, you wanna come on screen and, and Alan, can you work your techno magic? Great, um, I think I get to go first. Um, so Jenny, thank you so much for being with us and uh, for that beautiful reading and those comments. Um, it's really lovely to have you here. Um, when I was reading Go Went Gone, I was really struck by its deep sociological and journalistic impulses. And as we've already talked about, it documents a very real refugee crisis and includes many historically accurate facts. But the material is fictionalized. It's presented as a novel. Um, and Lance got at this a little bit, but what I wanted to ask you about was if you could describe your relationship to genre, um, especially the genre of the novel, why write Go Went Gone as a novel? And what does that genre mean to you? Especially having just written a memoir that you specifically chose to title, not a novel. <laughs> May I, um... I start with a memoir. <laughs> the memoir is, um, uh, it is actually, it is a collection of texts I have written in the course of my life. Uh, texts that are directly connected to my life. So there is no change of uh, uh, yeah, subjects, it's or persons or whatever, it's, it's, um, I wouldn't have made a novel out of it because it's it's like um, they are short pieces put together and all together they are so many views and and looks at things so so I think they 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 form a memoir but they don't form a novel <laughs> the novel I think needs um, a different kind of um, uh, uh, in German, I, I I knew how to say, but in English, uh, perhaps a different kind of glue, so to say, what what keeps the different stories together. So they, um, it's also the novel gives, as at least for me, it's uh, it gives me more freedom to. Uh, to connect stories that might seem to be apart from each other, to, to uh, write about parallels uh, and to also emotionally, it's different. You 
in a novel, you would follow the characters, you would um, uh, you you enter a novel and you and you in a way you you exit <laughs> in the end. It's it's a different way of storytelling, I, I would say. And uh, what I liked about um, Go and Gone uh, to to make a novel of it was that there are so many different stories. Also, if you only take the stories of the ref refugees themselves, they come from different countries. They have so many different reasons why they came to Europe and how they came to Europe. And then you have the, the Germans on the other side who have their experiences and to put all this together is like, um, I think it's, Um, I wanted to to put it together in a way that really also like touches the people that can be read easily. That is no like documentary read, <laughs> you know. And and in the beginning, I I had the idea. I uh, perhaps you read it already. Like to to make a a brick and throw it in the in the in the in the living rooms of people 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 and I wanted the 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 wealthy people and the well educated people in Germany to read the book. I, I and I, I and not inform the people, but really touch them personally. So this this was what I tried. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. What a treat to be here. And Jenny, thank you so much for coming. Um, I, my name is Daniel. I was born a month before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I very much grew up in an environment where I took the, the rhetoric of, you know, tear down that wall for granted um, from the Iron Curtain to Trump's border wall, right? It's kind of been part of my politics all along, uh, resistance to borders in general. But I was really interested in your work, which is of course, uh, speaks to that experience with a little more complexity than that, um, particularly with At the Ends of the Earth um, and not a novel, which really kind of elevates these dead end, so to speak, spaces, these spaces that are defined by absences, um, kind of as you just spoke to this like this like almost maybe a small town, a place where a child can play, really. Um, and I was wondering, either politically or, or more maybe in terms of the literature, like what space do you see for a defense of walls? Is there a sense in which the wall is like a temporal or physical experience that in some way we would be remiss to lose? Um, or is that is that not the kind of claim you're interested in? Thanks. My, um, I, as I said before, I don't believe in walls. Um, I know that we, as human beings, it seems so. At least uh, somehow we we need um, we need uh, differences, or we 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 cannot face the whole world at once. So we need some familiar things. We need some small things that we can know and and get familiar with. Um, but. You might might call me naive, but I think as a I think we could try or we should try to think about living without borders and and to have smaller entities that we can rely on and that we are familiar with and at the same time uh, allow everyone to move freely. I cannot see any any you know, any reason why some people should be allowed to fly everywhere and have the right passport and other people who also want to uh, get a good ed education for their children or just want to travel, why shouldn't they be allowed to do so? And it's uh, sometimes when I when I travel to the US, I, 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 I was in the beginning in the list that you have to fill out as a foreigner, there was the question, are you a communist? You know, this is funny. <laughs> so it was like, are you selling drugs? Are you a communist? You know, now, yeah. And um, 
in a way the the uh, to make a border or a wall means that you make a front and the front in my opinion doesn't lead to peace in the end it's like if you open your arms and you allow people to 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 take part in things that are based in other countries or other worlds um they they will be you know they will be happy to to be allowed to be there and there's no no reason to to fight i think a border is always a reason to fight if there's a border the fight is included it's like a frozen fight you know mm -hmm. um yeah, I'm up next. Um, so my my question is in regard to homesick for sadness, um, the essay that you read from tonight. I mean, in that essay, you draw a comparison between ruins, which show up really evocatively in a lot of um, the essays that I'd read, um, and also unfinished things. And I was really struck by how ruins and unfinished things are inversions of each other. They're not the same, but they're um, visually identical to each other. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the connection between uh, those kind of two inverted processes, things decaying and then things not getting quite finished. Mm. Naya, um, I, um, when, the, when, when East Germany ended and everything uh, was renovated at once. It's like here in my neighborhood, all the houses have been renovated in the same time. Uh, I, I got the feeling that I'm I'm a bit sad to lose the unfinished things and uh, the things that don't look nicely. So it's I think it's a question of. Um, in, in, in the end of selling and buying, of course. Uh, if you want to sell things, if you want to rent out apartments for a lot of money, you have to renovate it. And, and uh, the broken things and the ugly surfaces, they, they disappear. But uh, in a way, I, I realized that, that I like the ugly surfaces. And I like to see the traces of war, for instance. You you see you could see the history at the Berlin walls because you could see the the where the bullets bullets hit the walls, the houses, and and you could see that that there was um, destruction, and it it reminded you the whole time of all the layers of history. They were to be seen, and now everything is clean. I distrust design, <laughs> you know. I, I like designers <laughs> because they're nice people and they have good taste. But in a way, I don't trust uh, all these apartments that are completely clean. Uh, I, it's, to me, it's always a question of how, how do they keep their heritage? Where do they keep the, the letters written by their grandparents? You know, it's like, I like broken things and I like old and dusty and yellow looking paper, you know, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. You understand much more when the surface is not smooth. Mm. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. Um, should we turn to some of our audience questions? I'm trying to... Uh, process all of them. Let me just see. Um, okay, let me just jump in with a couple of them and uh, see how many we can get through in just a few minutes. Meredith Morton writes, I learned a long time ago that the rest of the world doesn't view Americans as the heroes they often believe they are. Shock to so many of us. Uh, when I lived in Europe in the late 1990s, a German told me that he thought Americans had actually destroyed German culture. This was a shock to me, though it is no longer one. Do you think that Germans still feel this way or has this changed? 
um, I can only speak about the, the East Germans and, and the East Germans, they hadn't so much to do with the Americans because we were the Russian zone. So, so it was like the other side. Um, Naya, what I see now in the cities is we got the same kind of stores. We lost our the, the small uh, shops, uh, which were in, in every tiny village. So also here, people have to take their car to go shopping when, when they're living in a, in a village. Things like that are typical American to me. And, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't make, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's not only American, it's, it's, uh, it has to do with a different kind of life. I'm, I'm still figuring out, I, I, I'm, I cannot say something bright about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, you know, the Americans are, on one hand, it's like the future. And when I came back from America, I always felt like I go back to the past mm -hmm. in a way. And I like to go back into the past, even when I know my life is already over in a, in a, diff in, a, in, in, in a sense. Um, but, but um, the Americans have wonderful have made wonderful films they write wonderful books you know i I, w I wouldn't say the americans and even mcdonald's even i go sometimes to mcdonald's <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like this is also a cultural big thing to have these uh, fast food restaurants and and of course also the fast food restaurants are uh as far as culture is concerned perhaps difficult but sometimes you are in a hurry and you go to mcdonald's even as a former communist you know <laughs> uh, so uh scott abbott uh asks he says you write in not a novel the quote thomas mann's concern with the temporal structure of music continues to inform my thoughts and my writing to this day the transformation of the intervals into a chord of the horizontal that is into the vertical, of the sequential into the simultaneous, unquote. So might you talk more about the temporal structure of music and your own work? Um, it's funny because my, the title of my new novel is uh, Kairos. And Kairos is, is, comes from uh, the ancient uh, Greek philosophers and is an expression for the moment in opposite to the chronos as, as time that is passing chronologically. And Kairos is something that cuts like in the deep of, of time. And uh, in, in, in my opinion, it, it opens like, it opens uh, a look at all the layers and it makes meet all the different layers of time and um yeah what i what i try to do is um to have voices telling stories and go and gone of course and then to to show um the connecting points between them through all the different times like um, what I read, for instance, like the, the, the generation of post-war children uh, to which uh, Richard is belonging. Um, and I like very much to make a connection by um, also an impression of being close to a time that is, has long passed only by uh, by opening the you know by by making visible the, the parallels and the the similarities and I think this is an interesting thing to do to have the voices at once and then the the crossing points where all the voices come together. So that's wonderful. Um, 
So John Donovan, this, this is actually about music in a different level in, in your text. A lot of, how would you say it? The music of your language is lost as it comes over into English. And uh, John Dominey asks, I'd love to start things off uh, by talking about language, but in a sense, it's the musicality of language. Your title, Go Went Gone, is unique among recent English titles. And in German, it creates a marvelous echoing sonnet. So for uh, sonic, so for those of you who, who don't know German, in, in German, it would be Gehen ging gegangen. Um, what can you say about choosing that title and how it illuminates the story and themes? It sounds so much more beautiful in German. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't sound too too ugly <laughs> in, in English. <laughs> now there was a big discussion actually in German as well in Germany as well as in in, in the United States <laughs> with my my New York publisher. So there there was a long um, discussion because uh, the the question of the title of course is important, and I had so many titles for the go one gone before I had a long list of titles I even made meetings with my friends and let them choose their favorites mm. and I really I, I, I was desperate and uh, all of a sudden it came to my mind that this is a good title because it's like the German grammar and and the, the refugees the, the the one of the main questions is always do they learn German and do they are they able to learn German are they willing to learn German and are they given the chance to learn German? So this is a very central question, the, the, the language. So it's like the grammar form of a verb. And it's also the, the passing of time to go, to have been gone also in, in the sense of passing away, uh, but also in the sense of changing countries and seeking refuge and so on. So I thought this this is the perfect title, and I I fought for it, and I think it's good because it's it's so strange that nobody can ever forget it anymore because it's so strange, and this is the good thing about it. It is, it is. Well, I I think we uh, need to begin to wrap up. So nur ein bisschen auf Deutsch. Das war wunderbar, Jenny. Oh. Um, oh, und es war sehr, sehr nett, um, Sie zu hören und ein bisschen kennenzulernen. Um, aber ja, es tut mir leid, uh, aber wir müssen uh, los. Also vielen, vielen Dank. And let me turn things back to Alan. Do you want to wrap up? Ja, wow. sure thing. Um, so on behalf of the University of Utah Creative Writing Program, thank you again, Jenny. Vielen Dank. It's been a, a true privilege and delight to share some of your time. Uh, and thanks to Lance Olson, who had the brilliant idea of inviting you and for moderating our conversation today. Thanks also to Amy, Corley, Alyssa, and Daniel. Uh, and for those of you in attendance, we're so glad you could join us this morning in the States or in the evening in Europe, as it may be. Uh, and I hope you all have a great day. So cheers. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Jenny. It's been wonderful to spend some time with you. And thanks again, Lance. Thank uh, thanks you. for the for the difficult preparation of this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> More than worth it. More than worth it. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>